Okay, so done with uh, administrative stuff. Last time we continued looking at the calculus of variations and we derive using <coughs> integral calculus the, the definition, I guess, of the variation and also we derive the um, Lagrangian again. So now we're going to look at conservation theorems and symmetry properties. And I thought that I could cover these in half a lecture and then start chapter number three. Uh, but you know, this is one of the most beautiful topics in the class, I think. And so I think it deserves our full attention. So <clears throat> in general, the equations of motion so Lagrange's equations um, of a system with n degrees of freedom is going to consist of how many differential equations? differential equations if, if the system has n degrees of freedom? n? Right? So we get a differential equation for each degree of freedom. So if it's in three dimensions, then we have three differential equations for x, y, and z, for example. Um, these differential equations are of what order? In time. Second order. Right, so you get an acceleration. So if you do perform all the integration, many um, constants of integration do we get? Well, we have n differential equations uh, and we integrate each equation twice, 
and we're gonna get one constant of integration for each of these integrals. So we have 2n constants of integration. So how many boundary or initial conditions do we need to fully specify everything? Hmm? Limits? Integration limits. Um, well, if we don't have limits, you just plus the you just put the plus C in there, you know, just to it's gonna be you know whatever. Well, I'm gonna put this here in here. Mm. Plus the constant. So we get one constant of integration for each integral. So if we have <coughs> um, n, we integrate in twice, we get two constants for each equation. So we get two n constants of integration. So we need uh, two n initial conditions to uh, specify the system. So these initial conditions are going to be <coughs> Um, the initial position and the initial velocity in each of the components um, x, y, and z. So this will be, um, you know, if we have, uh, if we are in 3D, then it will be why not? This will be the initial velocity in the component in x, initial velocity component in y, initial velocity component in z, and so on. So we get, if we use the generalized coordinates, it will be q and q dot j, q j and q dot j uh, for each j. So, you know, this, uh, Sounds like a lot of work. The a second order um, equation, so you will make everything equal to zero, right? So that the equations are homogeneous. So it will be, it will look like this. So you could arrange each one of these and you get your system of equations. You can put in a matrix, you can do other manipulation. So most of the time, you are actually not going to have all of this information about a system. But this kind of analysis will still help you so, uh, oops, I think it was. So this is in general. Sometimes I'll say not most of the time. 
the equations of motion will be integrable. It will not be sometimes because you don't have enough uh, initial conditions, but more likely the, uh, the integrals will be just too darn hard. So, you know, there's no known and analytical solution. And so often what we try to do is um, uh, extract information without doing the integrals by looking at the uh, conserved quantities. Right, so maybe the linear momentum will be conserved along certain direction or <coughs> the angular momentum might be conserved along you know, some axis. Uh, you know, that will tell you that you don't have a force in that direction. So, We're going to further simplify our approach here by mostly considering uh, conservative forces. So that means that the potentials will depend only on the positions, but not on the velocities. So if we have a system of I particles, they interact with the potential so the potential will depend only on the position so we get rid of this one Then the Lagrangian, the derivative, <coughs> partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the degree of freedom, um, the, the velocity, by definition is the partial derivative with respect to the velocity in this axis of t minus v, right? It's just what we know the Lagrangian is. So this is partial derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to the velocity minus partial derivative of the potential with respect to the velocity and we are specifying that the potential does not depend on the velocity. So we can, um, can forget about the second term. And this is gonna be partial derivative respect to the velocity x dot i then we're going to sum 
over all j of the kinetic energy Right, so that's just the definition of the kinetic energy. This is equation um, 2.43 in the book. And they use I as the index here. It doesn't make sense. Um, it's a different index. But anyways, the derivatives are along the derivatives along um, orthogonal directions. So y and z are going to be 0. So we only have this one that matters in that direction anyways. And so this is going to be this, which um, is one half times two mi xi dot. So we get rid of these twos, and what is mass times velocity? Linear momentum, right? So this is the linear momentum of particle I along the x direction. So this is going to help us with a definition. We're going to say that the that PJ, our friend PJ, is the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to Q dot J. Right, so we're using this, and <clears throat> we're going to call this the generalized momentum. So we can see that if we just have Cartesian direction, uh, well, we get the component of the linear momentum along that direction. So yeah, generalized momentum is also called uh, canonical momentum or um, conjugate momentum. But I like to keep generalized because it reminds you that it comes from the generalized uh, coordinates. So we take the velocity along z and uh, y axis. Is it totally specified if it's along x axis? Uh, if it's along the x axis? I mean, we take the velocity of uh, z and y direction, right? 
Um, these ones? Zero, yeah, yeah, zero. Yeah, because they're orthogonal directions. So it's given that the particle was along y axis, I mean, from the. These are components. So, you know, it might be. It might be in this direction. Like so it'll be the momentum. This is the x direction, this is the y direction. So you want <coughs> the component of the momentum along x. It will be, um, sorry, I cannot write on that side. It will be the x component of p. So if you want the y component, you know, it might exist, but then you will have to take the derivative with respect to y rather than with respect to x. Um, we can do that in general using this definition. So this is a very powerful definition. Uh, it's going to be very useful, but it has a few caveats. So let's look at them. So I'm going to put it up here so that it's visible to everybody. PJ is a partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to Q dot J. So caveat number one. QJ is not a Cartesian coordinate. Then the units generalized momentum PJ um, in general will not be the same as for um, the linear momentum, so kilogram meter per second. That is fine. Uh, the units do not need to be kilogram meter per second. So the caveat is easy. <coughs> Caveat two. If the potential depends on the velocity then the generalized momentum pj will not
not be identical to um, the mechanical momentum. The mechanical momentum is mass and velocity. This one deserves um, an example. So, what is an example of a potential that depends on the velocity? The most glaring one. So it depends not just on uh, where you are located, but also how fast you're going. I guess you can think about air resistance, for example. Right? The resistance depends on how fast you're going, so that will be dependent on the velocity. The uh, I think the, the most glaring one is um, electromagnetism, right? So, in this case, I'm going to start writing over here. The Lagrangian which is T minus V it's gonna be the sum of um, all the, the kinetic energies of uh, each particle minus the um, electric field, so it'll be the charge, and I'm going to use the letter E for the charge. Let's say that they're electrons, and this is going to be phi, um, a potential that will depend on the position. plus the charge times the, um, the vector field. So you have the uh, the electric part and the magnetic part. Um, oh, this one depends. Mm. Yeah. So you have the the velocity over here. So in this case, P J. Derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to um, 
QJ dot. So let's look at the momentum of particle I along the X direction. So then this is gonna be the derivative um, of X I dot. So, um, oh, I guess I missed the one half over here. So this one is gonna be mi, xi dot, and then for the scalar field, we get What is the second term, the scalar field? Why? Right. So if we only had an electric field, then so be it. This would be mechanical momentum. But we also have the vector potential. So this would be the charge of I the vector field mm. times the derivative or partial derivative um, One? one okay so if we have r dot over here this is only the x part so we get x at i so that's equal to one so we can forget about it and so that is the generalized momentum so this is interesting because when we were trying to do this using a Newtonian mechanics, we had to kind of force some of the conditions, in particular the, uh, the third law. Here, it uh, doesn't matter. It's already included automatically. So the momentum, I mean, the quantity that might be conserved if there's no force along this direction is not the mechanical momentum. It's the mechanical momentum plus this other thing. So, now let's do caveat number three. If the Lagrangian does not depend on a particular QJ, even if it does depend on the velocity of that 
Hornet, QJ dot. Then the equation of motion will be reduced to So this is just the um, Lagrangian equation, uh, the Lagrange equation. So it should be equal to zero. If it doesn't depend on QJ, then this term goes to zero. And we get that the derivative with respect to time of the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to that qj dot is equal to zero. And this is our friend over here, pj. So that means that the generalized momentum, um, yeah, momentum uh, along QJ uh, is conserved. And we use this for another definition. If QJ, generalized coordinate QJ, is absent <coughs> from the Lagrangian, the coordinate is cyclic or um, I think more appropriately ignorable. So cyclic and ignorable mean the same thing. Uh, cyclic is used more often. Um, ignorable, I think, is more clear. So I guess a caveat for all of these caveats. This assumes that uh, the QJs are linearly independent. That means that if you have constraints that you have not um, implemented into the equations of motion by using the Lagrange multipliers, um, then this will not be true. You need um, all the, um, the generalized coordinates to be linearly independent.
So <clears throat> what we're going to do next is we're going to derive conservation of linear momentum and conservation of angular momentum from the same equation. And this is kind of what we did before with Newtonian mechanics. We had to worry about the vectors and it was a hassle. Um, these uh, formalism already includes, um, as we saw in caveat two, the cases in which the mechanical momentum is entangled with, with something else. So it includes cases in which Newton, Newton's uh, third law is violated. So that's very nice. That tells you that it is more general than Newtonian mechanics. So using the example of the uh, magnetic field, if PJ is what we had before, so be derivative with respect to time of mx dot plus e a x is equal to zero, then this whole quantity is conserved. So remember that this is where uh, Newton struggled, and actually he was not very convincing. But yeah, I guess um, you do stand on the shoulders of giants, and he didn't have Newton didn't have Lagrange. Okay, so we're going to continue with PJ. We have um, <coughs> that equation. Let's consider a generalized coordinate. QJ, such that DQJ is a translation of the system. have the original we have ri which is a function of qj and we are going to displace the whole system so So 
this is the QJ. So this one over here is RI of QJ plus DQJ. And we will consider only conservative forces. This is fine, it's what we assume when we were deriving this stuff with Newton. So the equation of motion is going to be derivative with respect to time of the Lagrangian with respect to uh, qj dot minus partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to qj. We are assuming conservative forces, so this one um, wait. Mm, yeah, is equal to um, and potential. Um, actually, I don't like how I'm writing it here. Um, this thing is going to be equal to DDT um, partial derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to QJ dot um, minus DDT partial derivative of the potential with respect to QJ dot plus the partial derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to QJ. So we're just putting the T minus V in here. Um, minus partial derivative of the potential with respect to QJ. Okay, that's better. So it's in one line. So this is the equation of motion. So this is equal to zero. And because we are assuming conservative forces, uh, this one goes to zero. And um, we also have to Because DQJ is a translation of the system as a whole, that means that the kinetic energy is not going to depend on the position. Right? So you grab your system, you grab your water bottle, and you translate it from here to here. The kinetic energy of the particles is still the same. 
So this one is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so we get rid of those two terms. So um, we have pj over here. Partial derivative um, of t with respect to qj dot minus partial derivative of p with respect to qj dot and this one is equal to zero. So for the case in which we consider only conservative forces, um, this guy over here is pj. So ddt of pj I messed up these ones. This is negative and this is positive. Because you have the negative in there and you have another negative. So this one is positive. Uh, partial derivative of V with respect to QJ is equal to zero. So this is the equation of motion. So PJ dot is equal to minus partial derivative of the potential with respect to QJ. And this guy we saw it before is the generalized force. Which means derivative of a potential with respect to some dimension or some coordinate. If it's x, then it will be, you know, if it's a Cartesian direction, then this will be a regular force. If this one is a generalized uh, coordinate, then this is a generalized force. Uh, this one is QJ. And the definition of generalized force was sum over all particles, fi, which is the vector, partial derivative of ri with respect to the generalized coordinate qj. Okay, so we have some nice um, mathematics in here. We we'll have to hurry up. this one over here for a little bit. So the definition of the partial derivative is limit when d q j goes to zero, well limit of this ratio when dqj goes to zero. Right, that's just the, the definition of uh, derivative. So this is going to be equal to um, dqj up here, so this is the only thing that remains, 
and down here dqj and this is going to be in the direction n hat so this is equal to one so this partial derivative is just um, the unit vector of the n so if we put that over here we get qj is the sum over all i i's fi dot n hat so this whole thing is the total force so it's just f dot n hat so the generalized force is the total force along the direction n. So this comes from the definition of derivative. So pj in this case is just a partial derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to qj dot so is the sum of all particles mi ri um, dot so you know we have the one half mr squared so this is the solution so this is just a velocity and times So this will be just n hat so pj is n hat times the momenta uh, of each particle. So this is just a total uh, momentum. And so it looks like the force. So if QJ is cyclic this is equal to zero so we get that p j dot uh, all the PJ is conserved. Okay, so before we derive the special case for Cartesian coordinates using Newtonian mechanics, we show that if there's no force acting along certain direction, then the momentum is conserved. Um, and this is the same statement 
but from Lagrangian mechanics and uh, in general, so generalized coordinates rather than Cartesian. So I'm going to move quickly to the next one. Um, we still have these, and we're going to use the same equation. And we're going to use this, still the same equation. But now we want um, qj to be So all of these is common, but we want dq, rather than being a translation of the system, is going to be a rotation about an axis. So it's going to be, um, well, this is, let's say that it's very small, infinitesimally small. So this is the Q. We're going to have the normal to the, well, this is the axis of rotation. So this is the plane on which you are rotating the system. And based on some origin, I'm going to put it over here so that it's easier to see. This is Ri, so the initial vector. And over here, we're going to have um, Ri, which is um, Qj plus dq, j. Well, I guess it's just that. This angle over here between n and the and ri is uh, theta. So we're gonna get that delta r i with respect to qj the magnitude is r i sine theta which is this distance and the direction is going to be orthogonal to both n and and the, the um, kj so uh, we can write this in vector form as partial derivative of Ri with respect to Qj is n cross Ri. So we can substitute that in here. And so before we just had n hat, now we have n hat cross ri. And the same thing, I guess I got rid of it, for the momentum. Qj dot. Um, the other one's going to be. Before we had dot n hat, now is, um, well, actually, I'm going to win this one.
Okay, we have all this stuff and we're gonna use this vector um, identity. So this will allow us to put this stuff in the right order. So it's gonna be um, R I cross F dot and hat. Um, shoot, didn't have time. So, Gonna put it here for the generalized force. It's gonna be n hat. We can take it out. Dot sum over of the particles, and we're going to have R cross F, and that is the definition of torque. So QJ is going to be the torque um, about this axis of rotation, the one that we are rotating the whole system about. For the kinetic energy, gonna have Ri cross Mi Vi um, dot N. So I already use this um, identity to arrange these terms. Um, and this one is R I cross P I and this is uh, the angular momentum so PJ is sum of all the individual angular momenta that n, we can put the n outside. And this is just the total angular momentum. So just like before, we can see that if qj is cyclic, this one is zero, so dtj dt equals zero, so pj is constant, and pj is the angular momentum, so the angular momentum is conserved. I guess we have to go. So I wanted to do this in the in a single lecture. Obviously, I get it, I didn't get to it. So we derived the conservation of linear momentum and the conservation of angular momentum from the same equation. Uh, we just change it. We just changed the definition of QJ.
So we say that if you can translate the system and the momentum doesn't change, then uh, it's translationally invariant. The other option is that it is rotationally invariant. So those are two symmetries. There's a, a third one that we actually haven't talked about. Which one is the, the third? Um, I guess possible conserved quantity. Momentum, angular momentum. We use it all the time. We struggle because it is true and we need it to survive. What is the other thing that is conserved very often? Uh, energy. energy, good. So we will derive the conservation of energy from the same equation. Um, that happens when it is invariant in time, right? So this is uh, Neuter's theorem. Um, if your physics looks the same here and here, then momentum is conserved. If you rotate it and your physics looks the same, then um, angular momentum is conserved. If your physics looks the same here and in the future and in the past, then energy is conserved. 